Hi everyone and welcome to Lurking for Legends, a live video cast where we talk with people from all walks of the publishing industry. I'm Christy Stratus, historical fantasy and historical suspense author, and my awesome co-hosts are David M. Kelly who writes sci-fi and Richard H. Stevens who writes epic fantasy and we're going to be hearing some of that tonight. So since this is an interactive broadcast we encourage everyone to comment. Um, of course if you have any questions about our author's books tonight that would be great. We will link to them um, in the chat and also just anything you want to you know say comment on the live read. This one is a really really fun episode so I hope you guys will let us know what you think of our read and you know all of our props. Um, this is a prop <laughs> right here. <laughs> so tonight, as I said, we're doing a live read from two epic fantasy books. And one excerpt is going to be from Windwalker by our very own Richard H. Stevens. And the other one, which we're going to start with, is going to be from Wizard Girl by Karen Eisenbray. I hope I pronounced her name right, Karen. You did. Awesome. So since you're our guest tonight, let's take a second and you can just introduce yourself and your books to us. Okay. I'm Karen Eisenbray coming to you live from Seattle, Washington. Uh, Wizard Girl is actually the second book of a trilogy, the Daughter of Magic trilogy, which is complete. The three books are Daughter of Magic, Wizard Girl and Death's Midwife. And all of those were published by Not A Pipe Publishing, which is a small press in Oregon. And I have another series that's not high fantasy at all. It's a punk rock superhero mashup. And that's the <laughs> Saint Rage series. There's two books in that and I'm just barely started on the third book. Cool. That cool. is a great combination. A yeah, punk rock superhero. That would be interesting for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So we are going to start with um, with Karen's, with uh, it's Wizard really Girl. really fun to write. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. I can see that we have a little bit of a delay here. So as we're reading, I'm sure there will be a little delay. And that's perfectly fine. So, um, yeah, we're going to get started with Wizard Girl. And, you know, Karen, why don't you, unless anybody else has anything else to say, did anybody... Did I skip anything? Tell me. <laughs> nope. Okay. Well, I, I just thought it was uh, quite funny that uh, I'm typecast today as uh, David's father. So <laughs> I have to wear my shirt it's, I think it's just to perfect. rub it in because I know how much he loves Star Wars. So <laughs> <laughs> that's a double rubbing. Yeah, just double. Yeah, I could uh, always got to get that dig in there for sure. <laughs> Cool. Okay. So, um, Karen, why don't you tell us like a little bit about Wizard Girl and where we're picking up from? Okay. Um, the main character is Luskel. She is the daughter of a magical family, and she is a formally trained healer, though she has little talent for it. She's better at the kind of magic she's been informally trained in, and she wants to go against tradition and become a wizard like her father. But in her world, girls don't do that. But she persuades a wizard outside her family to mentor her. And on her first day of training, she is instructed to join a group exercise with other apprentices. This is kind of a pilot program, if you will, that her mentor is trying to get started to have more collaboration. And so she reports for this and it's her basically her first day of wizard school, but there isn't a school. So I will be narrating. Luskel will be read by Christy. And Luskel is a 17 year old female apprentice wizard who is impulsive and overconfident. Fandek and Barden and Luskel's father will be read by Richard. Just reading all the father characters today. <laughs> Fandek is an 18 year old male apprentice wizard who offended Luskel the day they met. Barden is Luskel's mentor, a wizard in his seventies. And Luskel's father Crane is a respected wizard and Fandek's temporary mentor. 
Lucky, Goran, and Thorn will be read by David. Lucky is a 10-year-old male apprentice wizard. Goran is a 12-year-old male apprentice wizard. And Thorn is a 12-year-old male apprentice wizard who really gets on Luskel's nerves. They're going to be so easy to differentiate. <laughs> Are we ready to go? I'm ready. <laughs> Luskel met her group in front of the hall. The ice was long gone from the square, but a raw wind blew. She pulled her cloak around her and watched the others. There were five in all. Barden had said she'd be with other apprentices, but never, never mentioned they'd be children. No one else in the group looked older than 12, except for Fandek. She wasn't sure which was worse. Fandek hurried over to her. I didn't know you'd be here. Are you teaching us that protective charm? I'm here for the same reason you are. I'm Barden's apprentice. <laughs> he chuckled. Very funny. Since when? Since this morning. I hope that's not a problem for you. No, it's... I mean, no, of course not. But why didn't you tell me? The skull stood tall and answered in the haughtiest tone she could manage. Because I didn't think it was any of your concern. Fendek considered this. Can't argue with that. I'm glad you're here, but why are we in the baby group? You, because you're a beginner, Luskel replied. Me, because there's been some mistake. She looked around for the masters. Just as they came outside, she marched up to Barden. Master, you've seen what I can do. Why am I in a group of beginners? I'm sorry, Lascal, but I don't see any other way to do it. You are a new apprentice in spite of your previous training and skill, and I'm afraid if I put you with the boys your own age, you'd be a dangerous distraction. They'd all want to impress you, which would lead to reckless competition. That's their fault, not mine. That may be, but it would still be too much of a risk. She gestured with her head toward Fandek. What about him then? Nothing I can do. He's more of a beginner here than anyone. I'm sorry, but this is the best arrangement. You're lucky to be here at all. But... No more arguments. Join your group or just go home. Yes, Master. The skill stomped back to the cluster of apprentices. Why should she be penalized for the potential behavior of people she didn't even know and couldn't influence? Meanwhile, those same people got to do whatever they got to do without any penalty. They didn't even know how they were infringing on Luskel by their mere existence. She scowled sidelong at Fandek, the only representative of this group. Why do we have to have a girl in our group? One of the boys complained in a loud voice. Luskel started toward him. I'll show you why, you little. Fandek caught her wrist. Don't waste your time. Don't touch me. She yanked her arm away. He was right, which only made Luskel angrier. And something about his fingers on her skin reminded her of her mother. No, not exactly, but it gave her that same sense of well-being and comfort, enough that she could almost forget her anger. She took several deep breaths to calm herself the rest of the way. Barden joined the group of apprentices. Form a circle, he instructed. He carried a wooden ball into the middle of their ring. When he let go, it floated there. In this exercise, you'll send the ball to another member of the group. When it comes to you, deflect it to someone else. We're watching for accuracy and quickness as well as power. Call out the name of the boy, pardon me, the apprentice you're aiming for. Have you introduced yourselves? No? Well, what are you waiting for? Do it now. Everybody calls me Lucky. The smallest boy said. The skull guessed he was about 10. He had dark brown hair and a wide smile. 
I could always make the dice go the way I wanted. The next boy had red hair and freckles. He might have been 12. Go in. He said and crossed his arms. His voice cracked on the one word. The remaining boy, the one who had objected to Luskel's presence, had tousled blonde hair and stood a little shorter than Gorin, but with a heavier build. I'm Thorn, he announced, but gave no clue as to whether this was his real name or a nickname. And I don't play with girls. Luskel scowled at him. I'm Luskel, and I'm not playing. Fandek smiled around the group and raised a hand. And I'm Fandek. Nice to meet all of you. His deeper voice came as an unexpected relief after the harsh shrilling of the boys. The exercise began, and it was harder than it sounded. Lucky shouted out, Go in! But the ball wobbled over to Fandek. He tried to send it to Luskel, but had trouble getting it to move at all. When it did move, it went to Thorn, who succeeded in pushing it to Gorin. Gorin sent it to the middle of the circle, where it stopped. The Skell expected some direction from the masters, but they were talking among themselves. Were they even paying attention? Guess it's up to me. Before she could cast a spell, Thorn hopped into the center and pushed the ball with his hand. Hey, you're not supposed to touch it. The skull objected. Who says? I don't have to listen to you. Little respect, Vandek said. Nice coming from you, Luskel muttered. During this exchange, the ball drifted to Lucky, who sent it to Gorin, who deflected it to Vandek. Vandek had better luck this time, at least in terms of momentum, but his accuracy was unimproved. The ball floated to Lucky, who sent it in Luskel's direction. Finally, she was beginning to think she'd never get a turn. Need help, wizard girl? Thorn sneered. Think fast, Thorn. Luskel repelled the ball with a flick of her hand. It shot straight at him and hit him in the face. He sat down hard and clapped a hand over his nose. Blood oozed between his fingers. It broke my nose! <laughs> the skull hurried over to him. He squealed and tried to scuttle away. Hold still! The skull pressed her hand to his head to get a sense of the injury. It's not broken. It's only bloody. She drew on her power, more than she'd used for the repelling charm, to stop the bleeding and ease the pain. Thorn watched her in stunned silence, his eyes wide. After a moment, he felt his nose gingerly, then stared at the blood on his hand. His face went pale. Really? Tough boy gets squeamish about blood? Although Luskel didn't consider herself a healer, blood had never been a problem. But Thorn didn't seem so tough now. The anger drained out of her. She pulled out her handkerchief, spat on it, and wiped his face and hand for him as if he were a much younger child. Sorry, I didn't mean to hit you. The other boys crowded around. How, how did you do that? Goran asked. His freckles stood out in a pale face, and he gave off a mix of fear and respect. The skull glanced up at him and smiled. It was a basic repelling charm. Sometimes I don't know my own strength. No, not that. His nose. How did you stop bleeding like that? It's one of the first things a healer learns. Thorn wrinkled his nose and flinched. It would be tender for a while. Go, magic. He sneered. The skull wanted to smack him. If that's your attitude, maybe I did mean to hit you. Get up. Everyone's waiting. She held out her hand, but Thorn ignored the offer of help and got up on his own. He moved off as far from her as he could. 
The wizard stood back and watched without interfering. All five conferred a quiet but impassioned argument. The skull couldn't hear what they said, but they kept glancing at her. Finally, they reached some kind of agreement. Barden stepped toward the apprentices. It's clear that Lascelle already knows how to repel effectively. The rest of you could use more practice. Lascelle, be so good as to instruct the rest of the group. Her father gave her a stern look. Don't hurt anyone. He glanced at Thorn. Anyone else, I mean. She scowled at him and mind talked. He asked for it. And so did you. If you want to be taken seriously as a wizard, you'll have to show greater maturity than the other apprentices. That was close to what Barden had told her. Apparently it wasn't enough to display more power and skill. She also had to be the adult in this crowd of children. It wasn't fair. The skill took several deep breaths and unclenched her fists. She turned to Barden. May I use an assistant master? Of course. Who do you choose? The skull gazed at each of the apprentices in turn. Thorne averted his eyes. Fandak. His grin was far too pleased as he stepped closer to her. What do I have to do? Just stand there. We've done this before. His brows drew together in a puzzled expression. She sent him a mental image of their first meeting when she made him fall. His mouth dropped open as he understood. He shook his head and laughed. At least he was a good sport. This time, she spoke the spell aloud so all could hear it. She used only enough power to drive him back, not to make him fall. When he'd recovered, she did it again, then let him try it on her. It took a few tries and all Luskel's patience, but Fandek finally got it to work. After the demonstration, the younger boys took turns with each other. When they could do the charm consistently, they worked with the wooden ball again. By the end of the exercise, everyone's accuracy had improved and no one else got hurt. You've got the makings of a good teacher, Barden commented. Maybe you'll have your own apprentice someday. Skell gave him a surprised smile. Thank you, master. But do you think I'd have the patience? Uh, if you work on it, and if you can control your temper. That's it. Yeah. Good job. Well, my ever Thank you. This, that was uh, good. You must be. <laughs> Thank you. That was very good. That was fun. That was fun. Sounds like a great, I want to go to the school. Sounds cool. <laughs> <laughs> so Mental we still method. have to find a name for that, so I look forward to hearing the name of the school that we're at. So is this, sorry, is this book done, Karen? Yes. This, this book actually came out in 2019. Oh, awesome. So it was one of my, one of my three pre-pandemic releases. JD said so it was very fun, 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 fun. I don't know. And I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm actually working on a, a, a spinoff that takes place about twelve-ish years later. And by then there is a school, and I, you're right. They should have a name for it or something better than just going to the wizards' hall to have lessons. The lurking I'll for have legends to think school. About that. <laughs> yeah, there yeah, you lurking go. Lurking for legends school. That might be it. Yeah. I mean, Richard uh, was was channeling his inner Obi Wan. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I, I watched the I watched the new Obi Wan, and I didn't mind it too much. Kenobi, it got a lot of flack, but I didn't mind it too much. I'm a I'm a Star Wars geek through and through, so it doesn't matter to me as long as it's Star Wars. I love it. And sorry, Dave, that wasn't a dig at you this time. <laughs> <laughs> Not this time. So. I will uh, just set up uh, what I'm going to do. We're going to be reading uh, an excerpt from Wind Walker. And I just want to let everybody know that I tried to get R.A. Salvatore, and I wanted to uh, have it as a bombshell. 
And he has been, of all the people I've reached out to, I've reached out to Rowling, I've reached out to King and Sanderson. And you know, her, Rowling's uh, handler did get back to me. No one else did other than Ari Salvatore. And Ari Salvatore actually got back to me personally and uh, he said he couldn't. But uh, I, I thought if I could land him and bring him in here, that'd be uh, something really cool. Or I don't know if people know who Ari Salvatore is, but he writes the Dark uh, Drow series. He's got about... 5,982 books in that series and that's every book's just amazing so I, I can't wait to read them and maybe someday we'll get to uh, Ari Salvatore here on Looking for Legends so. Persistent, but, uh, you're going to get him <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it'd be fun So anyway, my extra is Transform What's that? Okay, yeah uh -huh. oh, Dave is leaving the screen, that's the trouble And you know what, I almost have to leave the screen and that's funny Okay, I will, I'm just going to take this off as I thought so I'm writing an excerpt from Wind Walker, book three in uh, Mahai with Guardians. It's actually, that book will be done tomorrow or the next day, hopefully by Friday anyway. And uh, it probably will weigh in at about 170, 175,000 words. It's uh, it's totally blown Keeper of the Jewel away as far as length. And I hadn't planned on that. I At one point, I thought it was maybe kind of coming to 120 and it just kept going. But it should be done this week. And this is an excerpt from it. So uh, forgive it if it's a little crude and a little rough. I did make a... a a change in my narration because I realized there was a mistake in my wording. So it hasn't been uh, the best yet. And uh, so bear that in mind. So the scene set up is in the early morning hours, Pecklin Ors, who is a, an elf, uh, he's the, the high cliff dragon trainer, dragon rider trainer, and staunch defender of the Crystal Cavern. So the Crystal Cavern is this uh, magical cavern that uh, they're trying to keep out of the hands of the, the evildoers in South March. And he's standing on a great ledge outside of the high cliff complex, which is way up over top of this lake and uh that's where they've taken princess odling to keep her safe from the people that are to want to assassinate her, hoping the dragons can keep her safe and uh Eklund is about to be part of a potentially fatal summoning spell and uh this is the scene set up for it the only one who's ever survived this summoning spell before is the bumbling wizard called scale nice <laughs> i was waiting for you to notice <laughs> And David is Peckman. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, awesome. Beautiful. Did you just grow that real quick? Like, have you got that, like, hair tonic or what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can see Bugs Bunny, that Bugs Bunny cartoon, the Barber Seville, when he's doing Elmer Fudd's head. <laughs> that was my introduction to classical music. So just one second, because i got to get in scene here. But let me just say, all right, in scene is narrator Karen. Poor Karen got the narrator in both scenes, and I apologize for that. Uh, David's playing Peckman. He is uh, he's an always happy male elf guardian. He's always smiling, Dave. Peckman always smiles. That's all he ever does. He smiles and he hops when he walks. He's uh, he's just a happy person. And then uh, Christy will be playing three parts. Uh, she's playing Bailwin. And Bailwin is an, an intense, no-nonsense female elf guardian. Scale is a bumbling elven wizard wannabe. And Dawnbreaker is a gruff female dragon, and that is why Christy's all in purple today. She's uh, being the purple female dragon. Like I said, she put that she's purple. And I am going to be Elfin and Eoland. And Elfin is a crotchety old goblin. He's better than seven centuries old. And Eoland is another goblin, and both of them live in the Elven uh, uh, land of South March. And Eoland is a thousand-year-old goblin. So as... Uh, Karen takes this away. I'm just going to get on the screen for a second and come back as my character. You go ahead, Karen, whenever you like. All right. Pecklin allowed the scroll in his hands to roll up on itself, hoping that when the time came, he would be able to read the ancient text Scale had copied for him. It had been a long time since Elfwyn had taught him the runic language. He tucked it into the lining of his cloak and stared out over Crystal Lake, wondering how much longer he would get to enjoy the majestic sight unfolding in the new day's light. The scenery had been part of his life since the day he was born. He sighed. As much as he prided himself in forever being optimistic, Life had found a way to beat him down. Engrossed in his commiserations, the touch of Belwyn's hand made him jump. I see you're aware of everything going on around you. 
Aylwin said, her sarcasm accompanied by a rare smile. You're going to kill me one of those days sneaking up on me like that. Despite being perturbed by his best friend's ability to sneak up on him, he wrapped her in a warm embrace, partly because it was his way and partly because he knew it wasn't Bailwin's. Bailwin forced her way out of his arms and raised her eyebrows. Just goes to prove that having magic isn't always a good thing, else you would have scared me. You would have sensed me. Hecklin chuckled. <laughs> you got a magic about you, don't you doubt? Her bright blue eyes glinted in the moonlight as she scrutinized his golden armor. Why are you dressed like that? He shrugged. No reason, just thinking. Really? You got yourself all kitted like that to think? About what? Nothing much. He faced the edge of the promontory watching lava ooze down the black slopes of the distant shore. Bailwin stepped in beside him and put a hand on his metal bracer to entice him to look at her. You and I may never become mates, but I'll always know you better than anyone else in the world. You're contemplating something drastic. I trust you care for me enough to tell me what. Pecklin held her stare, the words on the tip of his tongue, but he hesitated. Bailwin tilted her head. He knew she would never leave him be until she got what she wanted. Bailwind was not someone to be put off. You're right, of course, but I'm afraid to tell you because I know what you'll say. So? He dropped her gaze and stared out over the lake. The partially obscured moon refracted off waves far below. I need to be the one who tests Gale's new spell. Other than the incessant gust of wind swirling ash, silence settled over the promontory. He didn't have to glance at his intense friend to know that she stared at him with her jaw hanging open. He spun on her. We need to do something fast. Master Elfwind's getting worse by the day, and Oodling hasn't returned. But it could kill you. So will doing nothing. The more I think about it, the more I'm convinced that Oodling's idea for a dragon set is the only way forward. If we ever wish to reclaim the throne without killing thousands of innocent elves, we must be able to move around the kingdom faster than dragon flight. I agree, but why you? I can't see anyone else volunteering for the position to become the first Windwalker. Besides, my life is no more important than another. As the dragon rider trainer, it makes sense it should be me. Bailwind's glare bored into him, her breathing growing heavier by degree. She looked away to stare into the perpetual banks of mist floating above the lake. Biting at her lips, she swallowed and asked, Does Dawnbreaker know? It was her suggestion. Bailwind nodded and tapped his golden cuirass. You've already made up your mind then. Afraid so. Movement in the exit tunnel drew their attention. Scale and Eoland walked toward them, each carrying something in their hands. Bailwind's gaze flicked between the newcomers and Pecklin, clearly not happy. What? You're doing this now? Hecklin merely pursed lips, not able to meet her stare. And you weren't going to tell me? The anger in her voice hurt Pecklin more than she would ever know. He had purposely not told her, afraid of what he knew would come next. Bailwind lifted her chin in haughty defiance. Then Mirage and I are coming with you. The unexpected appearance of Master Elfwind sent a cold shiver up Scale's spine. He had believed the High Wizard incapacitated by his magic sickness, especially since 
Lyland claimed the potion she had prepared for him would leave him unconscious until sometime tomorrow. If not for the solid rock wall, he would have collapsed to the ground seeing Elfwyn emerge unannounced from the small passageway that led from his personal grotto. Going somewhere? Elfwyn rasped. Scale swallowed. Um, no. I, I mean, yes. Just stepping outside for some air. Elfwyn gave him a skeptical look, his expression telling Scale that the High Wizard was not fooled. How about it, Eoland? Is that true? Elfwyn smiled knowingly at the elderly caretaker. Eoland lowered his eyes to the brass scrying bowl in his claw-tipped hands. No, Master Elfwyn. Elfwyn simply nodded and gestured for them to proceed. By all means, continue. I won't interfere. Scale noted Pecklin's appalled look as the guardian spotted Elfwyn. With nothing left to do, Scale shrugged. He had to carry on, despite the fact that the High Wizard's presence would instill in him a sense of insecurity when it came to casting spells. Nodding at Balewind, another individual whose existence scared the heck out of him, Scale addressed Pecklin. You ready? As ready as I'll ever be. Scale searched the great rock shelf. And Dawnbreaker? Pecklin scanned the heights above the dark recess of the wizard's lair and pointed. Here she comes. The High Cliff Guardian had no sooner spoken than his dragon dropped from the shadows, clinging to the cliff face, her hard landing vibrating the stone beneath their feet. <laughs> Bailwind put two fingers to her lips to summon her dragon, Mirage, but dropped her hand as the blue dragon materialized from the shadowy ledges above, descending into their midst, his landing more graceful than his counterparts. Bailwind looked questioningly at Pecklin. Pecklin smiled. I know what your response would be if you caught me. Well, Scale said his anxiety mounting with each new turn of events. We may as well get this over with. Pecklin put up a hand to stall him and said to Bailwind, Remember, you asked for this. Bailwind held Pecklin's gaze, not appearing as confident as when Scale had first ventured onto the platform. Mount up and be ready. Pecklin said as he scrambled onto Dawnbreaker's shoulders. Bailwin did as instructed, settling into place at the base of the big blue's neck. She yelped in surprise as Mirage sprung into the air and flew out over Crystal Lake. Bailwin's lament was long and drawn out as her dragon carried her away. Pecklin, no! Looking sheepish. Pecklin said to Scale. Hurry. Mirage won't be able to deny her for long. If we're going to do this, we must do it now. Scale swallowed his apprehension, knowing full well that should his spell end up killing Pecklin and Dawnbreaker, he wouldn't have to worry about High Wizard Elfwind's wrath. Bailwind's revenge would see to it that there wasn't a piece of him large enough for Elfwind to punish. Pulling the enchanted dagger soul biter from its sheath, Scale dropped the scabbard to the ground so he could retrieve his wand of destiny from the narrow pouch on his belt. Aeland placed the scrying bowl on the ground between them, careful not to spill its contents. Elfwin plunked his staff on the ledge in front of him, leaning on it for support, and indicated the dagger, wand, and brass vessel. How's this supposed to work from the other end that the summoner requires the use of all this tripe? These are insurances in case things go sideways. At, all, at the first sign that I'm losing control of the spell, 
Eoland will attempt to augment my power with the latent magic contained in the bowl. Elfwyn's cynical glare fell on Soulbiter. Scale swallowed, feeling rather sheepish. I don't think we'll need to resort to something so drastic, but it can't hurt if everything else fails. Elfwyn rolled his eyes and hobbled over to Pecklin. If you're sure you want to go through with this, I won't stand in your way. But you know my feelings on this lame-brained idea, especially considering who's casting the spell. He indicated scale with the tip of his thumb claw. Oh, she's over there. <laughs> However, I've known you long enough to respect your judgment. Thank you, Master Elfwyn. Something must be done soon. You said so yourself. If the focal stone falls, so does the kingdom. From what I've heard about the shard's condition, we don't have much time. I won't argue, but know that Highcliff can't afford to lose someone like you. Elfman patted Dawnbreaker's foreleg. Nor you. Take care of him, big girl. I expect to see you both real soon. I'll give my life to keep him safe, Master Elfwyn. Of that I have no doubt. If there's anyone strong enough to bring him back, it's you. Scale stared hard, trying to appreciate Elfwyn's uncharacteristic compassion. Coming from the goblin, it didn't seem real. Shaking his head to clear his thoughts, he waited until Elfwyn hobbled away from the, the purple dragon and her rider. Looking at Aeolon for reassurance, the caretaker nodded. Okay, here goes. Wish me luck. Scales said, his attention diverted by Elfwyn shaking his head. <sighs> if you're relying on your luck, they're already dead. Elfwyn grumbled. Scales swallowed nervously and attempted to block the mounting pressure the High Wizard's scrutiny placed him under. Closing his eyes, he stretched his neck and shook his arms out to help ease his tension. He had already gone over the spell with Pecklin and Dawnbreaker, letting them know what to expect and explaining when, when they were to react. Taking a deep breath, he began the chant he had rehearsed for days on end. He feared he might forget a certain word or incorrectly place an emphasis in the wrong place. But as the spell passed his lips, everything around him faded into the background. He felt rather than saw Dawnbreaker leap into the air to begin her flight. Timing was critical. If he rushed his spell or Dawnbreaker flew by at the wrong instant, all would be for naught. Vapor trails formed high above the platform, coalescing into swirling clouds that melded together to darken the sky. Intermittent gusts of wind buffeted Highcliff, growing in intensity to the point that he feared he might be blown from the ledge, but still he carried on chanting in the runic language of long ago. Just as it had when he and Zorain had first reached the barrier and were transported to wherever they had ended up, a lashing rain pelted the promontory, causing him to blink rapidly. Reaching the pinnacle of the spell, Scale spread his arms wide and focused his eyes in time to see Dawnbreaker and Pecklin soar by overhead, the rush of air marking their passage westward in defiance of the prevailing wind tossing Scale's hair and tearing at the hems of his clothing. Vehemently enunciating the last syllable, Scale reeled in the aftermath of his enchantment. The exertion caused him to stagger dangerously close to the edge of the promontory. The winds had calmed and the rain ceased to fall. The clouds dispersing as quickly as they had gathered, basking the promontory in the glorious light of the new day. Of Dawnbreaker and Pecklin, there was no sign. <laughs> Oh, nice hands. <laughs> oh. You must be so hot. <laughs> Claws. Oh, wow. I shouldn't have put that on until halfway through that reading. 
<laughs> that was fantastic. I have to ask, Dave, where did you get that? Mm -hmm. Where did you get that wig? I know you had this cooked up. I, Dave and I did an event on uh, the weekend in, uh, in a town that's about two and a half hours away from each of us, but we met down there and we did a book signing event. And I knew at that point he had something planned for today. So you've obviously had that wig before then. I, maybe I don't want to ask the question, but where did you get it and what do you do with it? I I actually got it especially for the event. <laughs> oh, did you? That's funny. <laughs> yeah. I won't bother asking what you're going to do with it now. Well, no, that's probably a question best left unanswered. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. as well, you know. I mean, well, that's awesome. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, we really had a lot of fun. So, uh, and thank you again. So, so Karen uh, was. We had a couple other authors lined up to do this live read, and all of a sudden, they both pulled out. And uh, right at the last minute, uh, Karen stepped in, uh, filling the breach, and we appreciate her coming on in such short notice because it's it's not always easy, and we're always busy, and then. Uh, there's a certain way that I have her doctor up her manuscript so that we can all see our parts. And she did that very well and sent it to us in a timely fashion. Thank you, Karen, for doing that. You're welcome. I'm glad I could take part. This was really fun. Yeah, we appreciate it. And maybe we'll have you back uh, when we get back to a science or fantasy genre again. So we try to do a different genre every week or every month, I guess it is. So, we're not quite sure what the genre is. Maybe that's something that we'll discuss beforehand next time so we can actually announce that uh, on our show when we do with the next live read. But uh, we're so, this is still in its infancy. This is only our third one. Uh, we have a lot of fun with it. Uh, we keep trying to outdo each other with props and stuff like that and uh, trying to get our guests involved a bit. <laughs> so I can just imagine how these things are going to evolve. So again, uh, thank you, Karen, for being with us. And just before we go, uh, when it's... Uh, so actually, Karen, what's your next release? You just had one out a couple of months ago. Do you have another one coming up shortly? Um, I The only thing I have coming up soon is I have a story in an anthology that's coming in August. And uh, my story is in this same setting as the, the, the piece we read today. Um, it takes place much earlier. It it's kind of a a side story to a prequel series that leads up to the Daughter Magic trilogy, and that's the name of the anthology is Stories Within, and it has a really weird experimental structure, which is that everybody's story at about two thirds of the way through a character tells a story and it's one of the other stories in the book and then after all of that has happened then each of the stories has a character responding to whatever it was they just heard so it's it's nested all the way down and that's coming out august 5th nice where can people, where can people find their books sorry dave um my books are in all the usual online places and also any independent bookstore would be happy to order it for you if you want a paperback or a hardcover. Oh, that's awesome. Is there, sorry, is there anything else? I, I always jump in here and end this off real quick. Is there anything else that uh, Chris or Dave want to say before I sign us out? I think I'm keeping the hair. You are? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think you should wear that at the next book signing that we do together. You uh, are. Actually, we're doing a steampunk festival, so if we get you some of those big Coke bottle glasses and wear that, mm -hmm. that'd be awesome. I have to say, though, that growing the ears was the hardest part. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. No, that would actually fit right in with the steampunk. We just have to change your glasses a bit. Yeah. Dave and I are doing a, a participating in a steampunk festival on August 6th uh, in cold water, Ontario. It's a lot of fun. I did that in 2019, so I'm looking forward to getting back there. So... Before we leave, Christy, is there anything new that you wanted to talk about in the Christy stratosphere? I don't think so. I am back to writing, uh, yeah, writing Grimoire Society of Dark Axe book two. 
Um, I had to take a break just because there was a lot going on in June, at the end of June. So I'm six episodes in now and it's 11,000 words at this point. So, you know, this month is the month where I'm going to publish, start publishing those episodes. So keep an eye out. You can follow me on Facebook, facebook.com slash Christy Stratus. Um, I'll definitely announce it there. I also have a Facebook group called um, Christy's Victorian Darklings. And uh, so, of course, I, I actually post some um, excerpts over there. Um, and on Patreon, you can get um, you can get all of the episodes. You don't have to pay for tokens or anything like that. I just publish them before I publish them on Bella. So um, that's patreon.com slash Christy Stratus if you want to read it early. And for just one price, you just pay per month, a dollar per month. And you get to read it instead of buying the tokens and everything. So yeah, that'll be, I'll be announcing the date and I'll start publishing it this month. I'm looking forward to that. Awesome. All right. Now, how about you, Dave? Um, well, I uh, went to the Elmvale Sci-Fi Street Festival with you uh, last weekend, which was uh, a great event. Uh, lots of nice people there. And the other thing last week, uh, which was wonderful for me was uh, I actually managed to achieve over 3,000 words every day. So I added wow. 15,000 words to uh, the third of the Logan Logan's World series. So wow. that was really good. Yeah. Uh, I was really happy with that. It was steam world away. <laughs> that's <laughs> no, that's awesome, man. I, I'm lucky to get 1,500, 2,000 words a day. Yeah. So 3,000, I'd be really happy with that. I think my best day is like 5,000. I'm, I'm not a fast writer. It's Maybe just one of those things. Sometimes you know it kind of like works. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, mm -hmm. If I if I'm if I'm kind of like in a good sort of place, I can usually get around sort of like the three thousand mark. Uh, if I'm in a bad place, one. <laughs> <laughs> just write the word "the" and walk away. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So but, next. Sorry, Dave. You got one more? Anything else to say here? No, no, no. That's fine. So, so next week is a, is an odd week for us. Uh, we had a guest that uh, we could not get a hold of in uh, after numerous attempts. Uh, she will not be here, or I think it's a she. Anyway, uh, so uh, Lurking for Legends is actually going to be taking the week off. We're, we generally go every Tuesday. We're taking next week off. Uh, I'm on holidays anyway, so it kind of works out well. And uh, it's nice for Dave and Chris to have a break and not have to worry about this. And then uh, we will join you again in two weeks. And uh, we will just look for look forward on Facebook. Uh, we will post it a uh, week Wednesday, who our next guest is. And I apologize, I don't have that guest handy right now. So anyway, Lurking for Legends is off for a week. And we'll see you in two weeks from now. And if anyone wants to, if there's any authors that tune in and see these things and they want to take part in our live reads or just be on the Lurking for Legends show in general, uh, by all means, uh, contact David, Christy, or myself, and we will set you up with, uh, with the proper information and get you the forms to you. Uh, the live reads, we decide on a genre, and we do a different genre every month. So uh, they change around, and we go looking for authors at that point. So if you want to be part of uh, the live read audience or uh, participants, uh, please let us know that too. So until uh, we see you again in two weeks, uh, enjoy uh, the next two weeks of the summer. Uh, stay safe and take care. Good night, everyone. Bye.